For the last few years, I've had this sense that everything I learned as a kid about how America's government works is completely wrong. But I had no idea how bad things actually were until I saw this one graph. Researchers at Princeton University looked at more than 20 years worth of data to answer a pretty simple question. Does the government represent the people? Now, this is what they found. This axis here represents public support for any given idea. On the left, at 0%, are ideas that not a single American wants. On the right, at 100%, are ideas that everyone supports. This axis represents the likelihood of Congress passing a law that reflects any of these ideas, from a 0 to a 100% chance. On this graph, an ideal republic would look like this. If 50% of the public supports an idea, there's a 50% chance of it becoming law. If 80% of us support something, there's an 80% chance. You get the idea. Now, most Americans would probably agree that, with a few exceptions, we should be as close to this ideal as possible. Unfortunately, the way America actually works doesn't even come close. Take an idea that nobody supports, literally nobody, and it has about a 30% chance of becoming federal law. Now, take an incredibly popular idea, the most popular idea this country has ever seen, and there's also about a 30% chance of it becoming law. This means that the number of American voters for or against any idea has no impact on the likelihood that Congress will make it law. Put another way, and I'm just gonna quote the Princeton study directly here, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. So if that isn't a wake-up call to most people, I don't know what it is. And uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. My name's Dan Johnson. I started, as you mentioned, People Against the NDAA back in uh, Ohio. And down here in Florida, it's much warmer this time of year. So how are you guys all doing this morning? All right. no, this is Libertarians. How are you guys all doing this morning? All right. Much better. OK. So I wanted to show you that video because it prefaces really my talk, what it's about, which is politics, what they don't want you to know. And if you go a little bit back to my introduction to politics, I'm 18 years old. I'm sitting in front of my computer fresh, freshman year in fall of 2011. I'm sitting in front of my computer. I come across a video. And it says, 61 senators betrayed you today. And I remember thinking, 61 senators betrayed me today? How is that even possible? And I, and I watched the video, and it's about the National Defense Authorization Act, indefinite detention. Who's familiar with that? OK. That was my wake-up call. I remember doing about a month and a half of research on that video and thinking, well, if there's anything I can do to get involved, there's anything I can do to stop this, then I want to be a part of that. And uh, I found some people on Twitter who said, you can go to your local city council, and you can get them to pass a law nullifying the NDAA. So we started doing that. We built a coalition of uh, Democrats. Republicans and Libertarians, the Young Republican Club, Occupy Bowling Green, and the Young Americans for Liberty all showed up with us at city council. There was about 35 of us. We packed the room. There was standing room only. All these students, a couple of a little bit older people supported us as well. And uh, we had an online petition, 500 signatures. We present this all in front of the council, and we say, all we want you to do is protect our rights. All we want you to do is uphold your oath to the Constitution. That's it. All we're asking you to do is sign this document saying, of course it would never happen here. We'll never allow the military to detain someone without charge or trial in this city. And I thought that my politicians were there to represent me. Oops. And I stand in front of city council. We give rousing speeches, and we talk to them about it. And uh, I don't hear back for a little bit. But then I get copied on an email from the mayor to the chair of city council. And it says, and I'll quote it the best I can right now, these students should have taken government 160. They don't know the inner workings of our national government, and it's up to us in some respects to educate them on how they might best and most appropriately redirect their voices. Don't talk to us. We're not part of the solution. We're a politician. What do you think? And I remember going home uh, that night absolutely devastated. And I know that it is that at point most people quit. They get involved, they get shot down, they back away. And I remember thinking, 
I have two options here. I can either go back to school, get into politics once I graduate, get my degree, work my way up the chain, you know, city council, state representative, you know, work my way up, or I can prove this guy wrong. And my parents raised me stubborn. So I decided to prove my mayor wrong. Long story short, within about a year, we had 75 chapters across the country. We called it People Against the NDAA. By the end of the year, we decided we wanted to launch an operation like no nonprofit, no group had ever seen, Operation Homeland Liberty. We were going to beat the NDAA in all 50 states by the end of the year. Their governors were going to sign, in, sign into law our bills. Now, we ended up introducing or pushing, helping other groups introduce, such as the 10th Amendment Center, legislation in 23 states across the country. Not a single bill worth anything got signed into law. And in September, I go to a conference called Libertopia. Has anybody ever been there? You can admit it. Um, <laughs> most crowds, there'll be no one. But I go to this conference, and I run into a guy by the name of Ernest Hancock. Does anybody know who that is? A couple of you. OK. And I'm telling him about, I'm telling him all this. And I'm telling him the frustration we had. Because I would be sitting in class, and I would run out to go take a call from a state representative. And I would get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I would stay up till 3 o'clock in the morning just so I could email a state representative and talk to them about the NDAA. And I, my grades started dropping because I was dedicating so much time to this. And to be there at the end of the year in September, at the end of the legislative season, and to have nothing signed into law that was worth anything. I was expressing these frustrations to him. And he's, he kind of he listens for a while. And he kind of stands there, and he looks at me. And he goes, so let me get this straight. You're building a big collective, and collectively, you're going to defeat collectivism. <laughs> I remember thinking, ooh, I need some aloe vera for that burn. Um, <laughs> but he was right. And uh, between that and another revelation that I'll talk about a little bit later, we shifted tactics with Panda entirely. For that first year and a half, we had nothing. In the next six months, we had 11 pieces of legislation signed into law. From there, I started an activist training center. Since then, we've helped dozens of people across the country fight their local government and win, from Alaska all the way down to Florida. And uh, now I'm head of the Tax Revolution Institute. And that goal of the Tax Revolution Institute is simple, that no one should fear the IRS if they've done nothing wrong. Can we start there? So what I'm here to talk to you guys about is the paradigm shifts that we had, that we went from a big activist group to a successful activist group, that we went from a struggling group of people fighting for liberty to people who politicians shrivel in their chairs when we walk in the room. And that's what I want you guys to be in every area of your activism for liberty. So the three paradigm shifts, you're taking notes, these are the three paradigm shifts you need. The three paradigm shifts are this. Number one, from access to power. Number two, from English to pressure. And number three, from understanding to fear. And then we'll talk about how to win. I want you to remember one word. If you're taking notes, this is the word you should scribble on your wall. Reputation. This is the only word that matters in politics. This is the number one key between people who win and people who lose. People who win understand this is important. People who lose don't understand that. Reputation. So why paradigm shifts? Why am I not just saying, oh, start this website and use these tools, and oh, you know, if you just get like 10 people together, your, your activism would be much better? Because we are in a war of ideas. In this room, everybody knows, I think, that Ron Paul did not get a single piece of legislation he introduced signed into law. People know that, right? Yet, you don't hear people talk about the Dick Arney re revolution. You don't hear people talk about the Jim DeMint revolution. You don't hear people talk about the revolution of politicians who did get their legislation signed into law. 
And people around the country are not inspired by politicians who got their legislation signed into law. The key is we are in a war of ideas. And if we are going to win that war, we have to start with paradigm shifts. We have to start with understanding how politicians think in order to win that war. So what doesn't work? Here's a few examples of what usually doesn't work. Protesting in the streets. Now, if nobody knows about your issue, if it's about uh, coral at the bottom of a local lake, you might be able to raise awareness with the protests. But how many of you guys have seen the massive Occupy protests in New York City? What did they accomplish? Jail. <laughs> they, a lot of them got jailed. Um, I was there in Ferguson for two weeks. They were protesting time and time and time and time and time again. Their city council still has their seats. Speaking with your representatives, anybody ever sent a letter to their congressman or wrote their congressman? What did you get back? A form letter. We love you very much. Please vote for us next year. Sending letters to your representatives, meeting with your representatives, trusting everything, or anything your representatives say, you're starting to see a pattern here. All of these are just practice. Has anybody ever played the game Mousetrap? OK, politics is like Mousetrap. If you play the rules by their game, you lose. It's set up to trip you up. If you walk in there, and you're polite, and you're careful with what you say, and you're, uh, oh, well, would you please represent me? That's the rules set up to benefit them, because they wrote them. So if you're going to win, you got to stop playing the game of mousetrap and start thinking outside the board. What does not work is very simple. Treating politicians like normal people. <laughs> now, you've heard the term men are from Mars, women are from Venus. If uh, today we are on Mars, politics is Venus. It's that different of a world. Because in politics, you introduce force. In your regular interactions with people around you, you don't force them to buy your product. You don't force them to pay you to deliver a service. You don't force them to uh, show up at a meeting. Politics introduces the element of force into the equation. What's the one word I want you to remember? Try it again. What's the one word I want you to remember? So shift one, access to power. I'll give you a classic example of access. Access is this. You call up your, your local politician. And he looks at the phone and goes, oh, John, I'm so happy to hear from you. Great to talk with you. Oh, yeah, your issue's so important. Yeah, let's have lunch. Love to have lunch. We'll, we'll take the kids. All right, talk to you later, man. That's access. A lot of grassroots leaders go for this access. They think if the politician picks up the phone and is nice to them, that they've done something that they've won that battle. But access is working for a campaign. That's access. Access is talking to your politician in private instead of public. That's access. Now, access gets you a lot of perks. And you'll see a lot of grassroots leaders go for these perks. And they'll fall into what I call being starstruck, banquets press conferences. Your politician will take you anywhere if you're an access activist. They'll bring you to meet your political heroes. I've seen people go from a grassroots activist to being on Sean Hannity because they were access. You give up one thing, though, when you are an access activist. You will never be able to change the status quo because it's what put you there in the first place. So if you're an access activist, honestly, the rest of the presentation isn't for you. I recommend walking out. But if you want to actually change the status quo, then you need to go for power. Now, power isn't easy. Power requires blood, requires sweat, it requires tears. It's long nights in front of the computer at 3 AM emailing your neighbor. That's what power is. And power is uncomfortable. Power is going to get people in your community going up to you and saying, did you really say that about that politician? You didn't really say that, did you? It's going to be breaking social norms like politeness. It's going to be breaking the rules when necessary. That's power. And if you're going to be successful in activism, you must choose between access and power. And in my opinion, you must choose power. 
I want you to guess who said this. The thing is, if Bernie Sanders is really grassroots, and he's really there for the people, then he would make room for grassroots movements and not say to the grassroots movements, you need to settle for what I give you. Who said that? Take a guess. No. Who else? No? If he was criticizing himself like that, that'd be interesting. But not quite. What? No? Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter Seattle. Does anybody remember when Black Lives Matter Seattle took the podium from Bernie Sanders? There's a big kerfluffle. Anybody remember that? OK. If you look at this video on YouTube, it has uh, approximately, let's see, I'm actually going to pull this up. If you look at this video on YouTube, it has around, look at that dislike count. It has about 4,000 dislikes and 304 likes. But I want you to listen to what she says here. I think it's very important. So here you have Bernie Sanders saying, I was prepared to talk about the Black, the Black Lives Matters crisis and the things that he would like to see change, but he was not given that opportunity. Bernie Sanders had several weeks to actually address Black Lives Matter, and I'm actually not concerned with talk as much as I am concrete platforms, concrete policies, and these politicians need to show us what's up. When Bernie Sanders was first confronted at Netroots, O'Malley said very specifically, I'm going to put out a criminal justice reform package, and you should expect every other candidate to do the same. So Bernie Sanders had the opportunity to do that and did not, so he lost his platform. So Bernie Sanders, after this uh, incident, uh, addressed this with new sweeping policy platform, he says, to combat um, racial inequality. He points out... So Bernie Sanders, who everybody says they should never have interrupted, Never interrupt Bernie Sanders. Why are you interrupting Sanders? He's the one who agrees with you the most. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you go interrupt Jeb Bush? Why wouldn't you go interrupt Donald Trump? When they interrupted Bernie Sanders, and they've interrupted Donald Trump, they've interrupted Jeb Bush, has Jeb Bush or Donald Trump released a racial justice platform? No. What did Bernie Sanders just do? What did they say he just did? He released a racial justice platform within one week of that interruption. It costed them, I don't know, what's four bus tickets cost? Those four bus tickets bought them weeks of airtime on their issue. They scored him and the Clinton camp released a racial justice platform. They got him to talk about racial justice in front of 28,000 people. Four activists, four bus tickets, two weeks of airtime. Why did it work? Now, BLM Seattle was roundly criticized by everyone. Oh, you're going after your guy. We're going to throw you into the weeds for that. How dare you go after your guy? But how many on their issue, how many Bernie Sanders supporters stopped caring about civil rights because they interrupted Bernie Sanders? I'm guessing zero. So while they may have thrown the name of their organization under the bus, and they probably could have been a little bit more polite, they probably could have, been, they probably could have had a little bit better tactics with that, but since they publicly confronted the person who was closest to their position in talk, they made that person take action. That is a key lesson in power politics, which is English to pressure. Now, when I first got involved in politics, I did the... I'm going to go meet with my politicians privately. I'm going to sit down with them in their office, and we're going to talk about the issues, and they're going to tell me how great of a constituent I am and how much they care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in fact, usually before introducing resolutions at council meetings, people want to go meet with their councilman first. Oh, hey, you know, I want to talk to you about this, blah, 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 blah. OK, I've stopped doing that. I don't think I've met with a politician in a long time. And the reason why is they do not speak English, period, end of story. Um, if you go to China, and you start living there, and you start demanding that everyone around you speak English, how well is that going to work? So you go into politics, and you start demanding that everyone around you speak a completely different language, probably not going to work. They speak one language, which is pressure. Give me an example. So let's say you know someone who owns a, uh, actually, best example, Seinfeld. Who knows the soup Nazi? OK, so soup Nazi, he gives out Really, really good soup, but he's an awful human being. Yet people go to him for the soup. 
They go to the soup Nazi and they get soup from him because he has a product to give them. And it doesn't matter what his personality is. You might know someone in your town who's like this. They have the greatest meats at the butcher shop. They have the best lawn service. But they're really awful. Well, there is no product politicians have to give you except for them. That is the only product they deliver, is themselves. What is the number one thing that wins elections? That gets the votes. What's the number one thing that gets the votes? No. Name recognition. It has been statistically proven over and over again that it doesn't matter what your policies are. If people know your name, they will elect you. And that statistic is really important to understand for understanding power politics. Because that's the only language they speak. Now, if people know that your name is, has a bad reputation, and there's someone who has a good reputation, they also know they won't vote for you. In politics, the number one thing that works is pressure. And the second thing you need to understand is that if you have your butcher shop, or the soup Nazi, you don't need to get the whole community to stop going to his store, because the whole community doesn't go to his store. You only need to get the people who actually show up to walk away. And in fact, you yourself can walk away from the soup Nazi's restaurant, and you can immediately punish him for bad service, just with that one walk away. In politics, in order to punish a politician, you have to get 51% of the people to agree with you before you can even make that move. That's the only thing that will remove them from their job. Want to be effective, you need to speak the language of pressure. I'll give you a case study. So Jason Cassell is a good friend of mine. He moves to Idaho. And uh, he's in Idaho for a couple months. He knows no one. He meets up with someone at a local city council meeting. And at a city council meeting, they're talking about uh, various city issues. He talks to the local Tea Party chair. And uh, he wants to stop the NDAA in the city council. So he starts coalition building. He doesn't talk to the councilman. He just starts talking to people around the community. And they're interested in the issue. And they're ready to take it on. So the first meeting, about 20 people show up, roughly. And the councilmen are like, wow, 20 people. It's a town of 3,000. This is a, oh, a lot of electorate here. OK? Next meeting, 40 people show up. By the third meeting, 80 people show up. They pass their resolution 3 to 2. Next, Jenna 21. Who's, who's familiar with Agenda 21 here, by the way? OK, so there was a smart growth grant given to his community of Emmett, Idaho. And uh, it was about $117,000, $171,000, something like that, for sustainable development. And uh, he's in a meeting, and he hears it going on. And he goes, hey, I don't have any time to be here. I've got to take a call. But can you please hold this off a couple weeks? He says this to the council. And they go, sure, absolutely, no problem. In fact, we're going to call you later and we'll put you on the advisory board to tell us how to do this. 80 people in a 3,000 person community, and they won't make a move without consulting Jason. Next, you had Jim County. So Jim County, they, they reversed the grant, by the way. They had him return the money. Um, Jim County comes up. And uh, Jim County, about 30,000 people or so, they bring. Oh, 60 people to the Jim County meeting to defeat the NDAA. And they bring, of those 60, three of them are council people from Emmett. How many of you guys get government officials from different governments to show up to pressure the other politicians? Hmm. And uh, the county commissioner, because he doesn't like his job very much, decides to say, all right, I don't want this many people in my building. 40 of you out. So, including some of the council people, who he doesn't know are council people. <laughs> and uh, he accidentally votes for the resolution because it's on the consent agenda. And then he goes, he has the gall to, after he does that, to go, well, since I voted for your resolution, I'm running for re-election. You guys should all support me. Within a couple weeks, he resigned. And then they decided, because politicians don't learn, guys, it just, it's something I've learned that they don't learn. Um, 
they introduced an ordinance in Emmett that uh, would have prohibited everybody except for city council members from carrying firearms in the building. That didn't go over well. So if you look at this political rap sheet, here's what he's got as a random guy in Emmett, County, or Emmett, Idaho. He has asked for an endorsement by the mayor, by a governor candidate, by an attorney general candidate, who he said, by the way, since it's a libertarian convention, he said, by the way, in front of about 100 people, that the attorney general candidate had no balls. <laughs> now, he was forced to resign a commissioner and a state senator. The state senator resigned because he didn't do a good enough job introducing our bill. He introduced the bill, but he didn't do a good enough job introducing it. This is the type of power you have without a lot of money, without a lot of influence, just by understanding power politics. Shift three, understanding to fear, is one of the most important shifts. Has anyone in here ever tried to reason with a politician? Okay. Did it work? All right. Because you're trying to force them to learn your language. Remember what Thomas Jefferson said. When the people fear their government, there is tyranny. When the government fears their people, there is liberty. He did not say when a government official sits down with you over a cup of coffee, there is liberty. He did not say when the government official tells you how important your issue is, there is liberty. He said when they fear you, there is liberty. Now, I've been accused now, now and again, mostly by politicians, of fighting dirty, which is their favorite word to throw out when you're actually having, making a difference. And I asked people to think about this. The founders called our elected officials people who had keys to our liberty. And it took eternal vigilance to make sure they did not use those keys against us. Well, what does that sound like? To me, that sounds like jail guards. So you imagine a scenario where a jail guard is beating a prisoner day after day after day. The jail guard beats up the prisoner. And some of the prisoners start making fun of the jail guard, start calling him fat, start calling him mean, start calling him ugly, start going after his reputation in the jail. Who's in the wrong there? The jail guards or the prisoners? Who's in the wrong there? The jail guards. So when politicians try to take your liberty, which they do every single day, why are you afraid to fight back? Why are you afraid to go after their reputation? Why are you afraid to put a satirical column in the newspaper like they wrote it, making fun of them? Why are you afraid of an editorial cartoon? Why are you afraid of interrupting them when they talk? They're going after your liberty. Martin Luther King, Jr., freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. So. Go after your representatives in public at all times. If they do something good, don't go after them. That's their, that's their uh, benefit for doing something good, protecting your liberty, is they don't feel your heat. They don't feel your fire. Every once in a while, you'll have a champion who you want to support, and you'll know who that is. And you'll say, OK, this is the great person. This is someone we want. But other than that, 99.9% .9 of the time, you need to go after your politicians with everything you have. No holds barred. Take the high road. And by the high road, I mean do not give up your integrity. I'm not telling you to lie. Be honest. The truth is more damaging than a lie. Use the truth as a weapon in what you're doing. But as long as you do not lose your integrity, you have to call your politicians out. A great example for the liberty movement, depending on who I'm speaking to, I'll bring up somebody else. But for the Liberty Movement, a great example of someone who should have been called out a long time ago is Rand Paul. Like him or hate him, you don't give someone who's closest to your side a pass when they screw up on a constitutional issue, when they, when they don't defend your rights, when they don't defend your liberty. You think if you send a letter to John McCain that he's all going to sudden going to start voting for your liberty? <laughs> but if you keep Rand in the circle, and he knows if he walks out, there's fire, and he knows that there's attack dogs there to pressure him from the people, because all the pressure he's getting in Congress is from the establishment. If he doesn't get pressure from people every time he steps over that line, then he'll become one of them, like most of the politicians we send to Congress 
who even believe they are good people. They are good people. They become part of the system. You need to call them out. Politeness is a tool used by the powerful to manipulate the powerless. Remember that. What's the one word I want you to remember? Reputation. Now, this doesn't mean violence. I do have to throw this in here. This doesn't mean violence. For number one, aggressive violence is immoral, non-aggression principle. You guys are very, very familiar with that. Number two, it's also stupid. Ever heard of a martyr? OK, someone who gave up their life for their reputation. Reputation is far more important than life, and it's far easier to take someone out reputationally than with their life. Now, at this point, especially since many of you, many of you heard uh, a speech given yesterday about how persecuted someone was by their local government, you may think, oh, well, OK, this is all good to know, but I'll never get enough people to back me. I'll never get enough people involved. Well, here are the statistical numbers statistical averages of how many people you need to get involved in order to be successful. So 100% is the population of your city or of your county. You can look that up on Google. Just Google your city, your county, plus population. 70% are eligible to vote. 40% actually register to vote. 20% vote on election day. 7% always vote Democrat. They don't care about those people. 7% always vote Republican. They don't care about those people either. That leaves 6%. Of that 6%, 3% plus 1 is all you need to control every single decision your local government makes. That's all it takes. And you don't even have to have those 3% at a city council meeting. You can have the leader of a group locally that represents 500 people. They show up, that's 500 people in the room. That's all it takes. I've watched it happen over and over and over and over again. And you actually have a document that's been passed around, faculty training, the real nature of politics and politicians, that goes into more detail on that 3% and on what matters with that 3%. So I want to bring us a real scenario in front of you. It's called a resolution and a post-it note. So I'm going to call you person A. You are person B, and you are person C. So person A, I'm the county commissioner. They come into my office, and they want me to pass a resolution. And they lay the resolution down, and they talk about how great it is. They want to stop the ban on jaywalking. They believe people should be able to jaywalk freely wherever they please. And uh, I, as a county commissioner, am going to listen. But about how many people do I think are backing that resolution? About one. So what am I going to do with that? I'm going to take it, I'm going to look at it. Thank you very much for bringing that to me. I really hope you vote for me next year, and I'm going to throw it in the trash. Person B comes in, and they bring the same resolution, but attached to this resolution is a post-it note. And on that post-it note are the names of 20 people in my district who support that resolution. And uh, about how many people do I think you think I believe support him? 20, 21, roughly. <coughs> I'm going to say thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you coming in. Uh, these voters are important to me, and I'm going to put it in the maybe I'll look at it pile. Person C, you come in. And you lay out a resolution, and attached to that resolution is another post-it note. But on this post-it note are the names of 10 organizations in my district that support this resolution. About how many people do I think support you? I have no clue. I have no idea, and it scares the crap out of me. We talked about fear. That's how you get a local government to respond to you. Talk to a couple local organizations. That's all it takes. Now, newsflash, you really can't do this alone. That uh, you as a lone voter, they have said over and over again, your vote matters sometimes, but not usually. Usually, you have to get people to go with you. And one of the most frustrating things to me, I did grow up a neocon, so a bit of an authoritarian. One of the most frustrating things to me was getting volunteers to do things instead of herding cats all the time. Because, I mean, especially with libertarians, herding cats, it's less like herding cats and more like herding feral cats. Yes. <laughs> So speaking specifically to the group leaders or people who want to be group leaders here, the fourth paradigm shift is from control to freedom. 
Stop running your organizations like socialists. There are three things that motivate people once their basic needs are taken care of. Number one, mastery. The ability to get better and better at a task and be recognized for it. Anybody ever get any video game achievements? OK, all right. You have been better at better at pressing on the screen, and you're being recognized for it. The second is purpose. And the and US Armed Forces, by the way, have mastered this term of mastery. They give out pieces of tinfoil for risking your life. That's how well this works. The second is purpose. They want to have a purpose larger than themselves. They want to have an impact larger than themselves. A perfect example of this is Wikipedia. They didn't pay anything to the people who started adding content to Wikipedia, and they don't pay anything to most of the people who add content. They just were behind a purpose. They believed information should be free. And that's why they worked for Wikipedia. And the third, and this is what most activist movements lack. I'm going to pull a Marco Rubio here for a second. And this is what most activists lack, which is uh, self-direction. Now, self-direction is uh, they own their actions. They own their movements. They own their ideas. They own what they're involved with with your organization. A great example of this is Atlassian Software. Anybody familiar with Atlassian, by the way? OK, they're an Australian software company. And they decided that one day of every quarter, they were going to have a day where their programmers could work on anything they wanted, just so long as they showed the results at the end of 24 hours. And they found that the bug fixes that got taken care of and the programs that got fixed during those 24 hours surpassed the fixes they had the rest of the quarter, all because they gave people freedom and respected it. And. Uh, that is something that you need to understand as an activist, is in an organization where you have control, where you have uh, specific orders coming from on high, or even from, like we had a bottom-up organization. If you have state leaders, uh, local chairs, et cetera, et cetera, one of the problems you run into is this. So the local chair starts up, and they want to start, let's say, a local Libertarian Party chapter. And they're like, hey. I need a logo. And then the state chair is like, all right, I'll get you a logo approval from National. And then National goes, all right, I'll get you a logo approval. And they send it back down to the state chair. And a volunteer organization, the state chair is on vacation for a week. He comes back. Four weeks later, the person who wanted to start the Libertarian Party affiliate no longer cares. When you have to get approval within an organization, instead of creating bread lines in socialism, you create liberty lines within volunteer activism. You have to allow people to direct themselves, which gets to the swarm. One note, the lesson here is that no millions of cash in the world, even if you do get them, can repair the damage to your organization if you lose your value base. Before we move forward, that is important. You cannot lose your integrity as an organization. You cannot lose your values as an organization. I have watched dozens of organizations get co-opted by power, get co-opted by recognition, get co-opted by people who walk into the organization. I've watched it over and over and over and over and over again, whether it's parties, whether it's nonprofits. Good people coming in with good intentions change the way their organization is going. You can't lose that. Moving on, five rules of the swarm. This is an organizational tactic invented by the guy I just quoted, Rick Falk Vignet. Anybody familiar with the pirate party in here? OK. You should be. Why? The Swedish pirate party is how they started. They're now the, national, the worldwide pirate party. They became the largest third party in the world in eight years. They went from nothing. They had a majority in Swedish parliament. And even though they've declined as a party since then, every single one of their platform points on defending the internet made it into every major party in Europe's platform. Started from nothing with eight year, within eight years. Here's the five rules they had. Number one, every member of the swarm is a leader. This doesn't mean democracy, which is number two. Democracy creates losers. So if you all get together, and I've seen a lot of organizations do this, brand new organization, we have a great logo to choose. 
and I want everybody in the organization to vote on it. And then you have another vote. What should we have on the website? I want everybody in the organization to vote on it. What issue should we take on? I want everybody in the organization to vote on it. And the people who lost all three of those votes will walk away from your organization. Democracy creates losers instead of democracy. Give people turfs, turfs that they can handle. Give people areas that they're the expert in. If you have a graphic designer on the team who is the best and knows what he's doing, he gets to approve the logo nobody else does. If you have someone who's great at sending out emails, they get to send out the emails. And they get advice. They get suggestions. Anybody can offer suggestions to any of the other leaders, but they are a leader. It is their job. It is their responsibility to make sure that that is taken care of. And you as a, and you as a leader don't step in on their turf and try to take it over. In fact, because most people are trained in this corporate hierarchy environment, they've got to wait for orders, they've got to wait for you to do something, they've got to wait for you to approve it. You have to continually tell your leaders it's yours. You continually demonstrate to them when they come to you with a question that they can answer. So what do you think? You're the leader. You're running this. What do you think we should put in the email? You're the leader. And yes, from time to time, you're going to have stuff sent out that doesn't make you look very good. From time to time, you're going to have uh, issues. However, on the whole, if you're a volunteer organization, you have to allow people to be the leader. It's better to have a couple issues than to have no volunteers. Third, set a vision that'll change the world, set goals that'll change your week. Nobody joins a vision if your vision is, oh, well, we want to drain the river one centimeter. Nobody gets involved with an organization and stays involved with an organization where their goal is uh, so far out that they never can say we accomplished something. This is why localized action works so well. This is why you should start at your development district instead of your city council, instead of your state representative, instead of running for president. Because you need to have goals that you can achieve. And you need to create that target and paint it red daily. You need to have a vision that will change the world. You can manage your vision, but not the message. You lay out the vision in front of people, and you say, here's where we go. Here's where I want to go. Here's where the party should be. Here's where our organization should be. You lay that out in front of people, but you do not tell them how to say it. Allow them to develop their own message. A person is much more likely to promote your organization if they can promote it the way they want to. Part of that control to freedom. Five, and this is very important. You give up results to gain control. When you require things to be approved through you, you will give up results in a volunteer organization because they don't have a paycheck to come to work for. The only thing they come to work for is what motivates them. And if you're not allowing them to be a leader, and they're not motivated, they will walk away from your organization. I've watched it happen to more Libertarian Party affiliates than I can count. And then you give up control to gain results. What we did with Panda is we had state teams, we had state leaders, we had local leaders, and we had the hierarchy. We dismantled all of it, and we created take-back teams that weren't entirely affiliated with the organization, so if one of them went off and did something crazy, like had a bunch of Nazi flags at a rally or something like that, then we could say, OK, not necessarily affiliate with us. However, we reinforce to them it's your movement, it's your ideal, it's your affiliate, it's what you are doing, and we're here to help. And when we made that clear from the very beginning, there are still, I haven't worked with Panda in a couple years, and there are still take back teams contacting me going, hey, we just confronted our city councilman today. Hey, we just did this today. Hey, that organization, the national organization, is a Facebook page right now. And there are still local teams around the country fighting the NDAA. That's how well that works. Empower your people to become leaders, and they will become leaders. Here's a case study to wrap it up. Kodiak, Alaska. No political activity there since 1997. They kicked fluoride out of the water in 97. And uh, about less than six months preparation. In those six months or so, uh, they fought the NDAA. And they brought it to their uh, city council. And at the same time, the borough introduced 
what we nicknamed, part of messaging, by the way, rename what your opponents do to fit what you're doing. They uh, introduced a uh, resolution, or a decorum amendment, that essentially if you were speaking to the borough, you couldn't uh, address anyone but the council, anyone but the borough, you couldn't address the audience, you couldn't accuse them of anything, you couldn't imply that they were involved in some sort of conspiracy, and uh, you couldn't insult anyone on the borough. And the borough's like a county in Alaska, essentially. Um, so we nicknamed it the Be Nice to Politicians Bill. And at the same day, at the same vote, the Be Nice to Politicians Bill came up in the borough on the one side of the island, and the NDAA resolution came up with a vote in the city on the other side of the island. So they had people split. The NDA resolution failed by one vote, but the borough assembly decorum amendment went down in flames to the point that two borough assembly members lost their seats immediately afterward. So they've had a little preparation. We've been teaching them how to do politics for a little while. And then they have this city planner come up from Seattle. And the uh, borough decides to pay him, uh, what was it, $117,000 or something like that, to come up with a new zoning code for the city because they want to be sustainable. And he comes up with a zoning code straight out of Seattle. Here's some of the things it did. It created a new department with absolute unquestionable authority over property decisions. There was none in Kodiak before then. And this department just so happened to have one hired position. Guess who got that hired position? The guy who wrote the code. Um, it set severe limits on fencing, fishing equipment, yard maintenance, domestic animals, etc. It's a fishing community. They said you can't have fishing equipment in your yard. Or they'll be fined $200 a day. And it set a 30-day limit. And if you don't pay it, your property would be seized. Now, these are fishermen. They might go out on the water for more than 30 days, not know there's a violation, and come back and not have a house. That's how bad this was. So the first thing we did was we wanted to build up pressure. We started alerting the community. We sent out these postcards, Red Alert Kodiak. Put the language of the bill online, gave them a link to go look at it themselves, put the highlight points. We also wrote a satirical article. And the, news, it, the newspaper published it. I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> One of the points of the satirical article is it's time for people to stop being so worried about their property rights and start thinking about what's best for the community. That created this. This is the city hall in Kodiak. There are 350 people there for a zoning commission meeting. Now, usually zoning commission meetings, anybody ever been to one? Zoning commission? Oh, wow. So you know it's usually, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> so you know it's usually the commissioners, two tumbleweed, and you. OK? All right. 350 people show up. There were 69 speakers. This is the hallway outside of the room. The room doesn't hold all of these people. This is a better picture of the hallway outside the room. This is the community. These aren't political activists. This is the community going, excuse me? What do you think you're doing? I remember there was actually talk of um, putting uh, politicians in crab cages and just kind of letting them float out <laughs> the water. <laughs> well, politicians don't learn very quickly. And that wasn't enough for them. Now remember, there's only 3,000 people here. This is 10% of the population. Um, and they don't learn very quickly. And they were asked several times, can we hold this meeting in a bigger room? And they're like, no, we can't hold a meeting in a bigger room. We're not going to allow it. Uh, we don't even want you to speak. They, like, uh, they recorded four hours. They cut off the first hour. They didn't put it online, so nobody could hear that. It was interesting. So people got even more angry and uh, went to the, uh, I don't have a picture of the newspaper. Um, they went to the meeting, which was held in the biggest building on the island, because they had no room anywhere else to hold all these people. There were 450 people here, almost 15% of Kodiak's population. And they told the commissioners to go to hell with their code. Some of the words exactly coming out of their mouths. Just before, just to, you know, uh, a previous speaker talked about the dirty tricks governments will play. Just so you know, just before this, 
the only newspaper on the island published a massive front page article that said it's over. They win. It was a total and complete lie. The code was not done. They hadn't killed it. And all the newspaper was trying to do was keep people from showing up. We went, the newspaper printed a retraction about this small the next day. <laughs> and that's how many people showed up, even with the only newspaper in town telling them to stay home. Well, they won. That code is not coming back. It's been indefinitely suspended. They'll try to bring it back at one point, I'm sure. But it's not coming back anytime soon because the residents of Kodiak fought back and the residents of Kodiak protected their property rights. They weren't political activists, but they learned how politics worked and they used that to every advantage that they had. So how did they win? Recap. From access to power. Not a single Kodiak resident met with any member of the borough assembly before that happened. They all just showed up all at once. They didn't ask. They demanded. Second, when Kodiak residents showed up, they were rolling deep. A lot of people with them. Third, they focused on one thing the politicians cared about, their reputation. In a small community like that, especially, if you aren't liked by everyone around you, you might not even get groceries that week. Here's their political rap sheet. They kicked one state representative out of office, two city councilors out of office, three borough assembly persons out of office. And one of the key things that happened during that fight was there was a split between people who believed it was Agenda 21 and people who believed it was just the city acting up. And they were getting mad at each other. And they were starting to create some infighting. So what they did was the head of the people who believed it was Agenda 21, the guy I trained, he said, no. We're not having this infighting. We're both working toward the same goal. We'll argue it this way. You argue it that way. You guys don't need to be under my group. I'm not trying to force you to be inside my organization to make this happen. And those two groups fought it together. If they hadn't done that, the movement would have imploded. He gave up control for results. So I want you to shift your thinking from access to power, from English to pressure, from understanding to fear, from control to results, and I want you to inspire a swarm. Anybody ever seen the movie V for Vendetta? I didn't even ask you to raise your hand. That works. The, okay. Um, the movie depicts, for those of you who have not seen it, Guy Fox masks marching down a street. The movie depicts, in fact, if you looked at the Occupy movement or you looked at some of the massive protests we've had, even like the climate change marches, they, if they had Guy Fawkes mask on, that would have been this movie. That's not how revolutions work. That's a Hollywood revolution. That's not how things get changed. It's not walking down the street in mass with masks on demanding something. It's one by one by one by one talking to the people around you and engaging the people around you in an issue they care about. That's what it is. That's how you create a revolution. You don't wait till all the stoplights are go. It's not a we revolution. It's an I revolution. You have to start it. You have to start it with your friends and family. You have to start it with the people around you. You have to start it with people you don't even know and you found in a phone book. That's how you start the revolution. It's a revolution of ideas. It's understanding how politics works and understanding how liberty works and understanding how people can use liberty to better their lives. And that's what I want you to do. Take this information. Teach the people around you how to fight politicians because the establishment knows this. They've been playing this game for a long time. And I'm tired of seeing liberty activists lose over and over and over again. There's a book by R.J. Rummel called Death by Government. It chronicles the number of people totalitarian and democratic governments have murdered over the past several centuries. Over 272 million people last century were killed by government. People want to know why I do this? want to know why I go around the country and stand in front of you? People want to know why I dedicate my time to activism when I could be doing something like dancing or getting a date? People want to know that? That's why. Because I'm sick and tired of seeing the biggest murderer in history get more and more and more and more and more and more power. There's not a single corporation 
And corporations have done some bad things. But there's not a single corporation that has ever killed that many people, even if you combine them. And I implore you to fight for liberty, to fight for freedom, that it's not over, that it is possible to win in politics, it is possible to win in liberty, no matter what your issue is, you don't have to get harassed, you don't have to get attacked, you can build up power and they'll be afraid to go after you, they'll be afraid to have the police knock on your door, because they know if the police knock on your door, you're going to bring a hundred people to the next city council meeting, and they're going to be out of office within an entire election cycle. That's what you need to know. And that's why I implore you to fight. And that's why I'm glad you're here. And that's why liberty matters to me. And that's why liberty should matter to you. Thank you very much.